Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sadegpur, for the introduction. Welcome to all our friends from the OIAC, members of the press corps, others who are here today. Uh, in the role of introducing the guest speaker, it, it's the oldest line in the book to say this, this person needs no introduction, but today it's sort of laughably true because Rudy Giuliani is one of the best known Americans of his generation. So please join me in bringing in in my honor to bring his honor to the stage. Please welcome Rudy Giuliani. Thank you. Ambassador, great pleasure. I'll just stand for a few minutes and then, and then sit down. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to talk about a subject that is very much something I've been concerned about for several decades and one I know that the ambassador has worked on, we've worked on together, and we feel very, very strongly about. And uh, that's the whole situation in Iran that um, has been such a disaster for us, America, and for the world. Um, there's a long history to this. I'll try to make this as brief as possible so that we have a maximum amount of time for the ambassador's question and for your questions. But specifically what I'm talking about is what has been going on since the end of December inside Iran and a few of the misconceptions about it so that we can put them in proper context. I fear that in America and really around the world, particularly around the world, there's the thought that these are very sporadic, they only affect Iran, they're not particularly organized, and they're just going to pass away and the regime is inevitable. All of that's wrong. The regime is hardly inevitable. Oppressive regimes in the history of the world have never been inevitable. In fact, the inevitable for a repressive regime is it's eventually torn down. And uh, uprisings like this, just from the pictures, the pictures that you saw and the uh, demonstration that you saw, obviously are not um, sporadic. They're obviously very well organized. Um, you, you saw numerous people in the street. You saw banners, but 142 cities were, event, were involved, which means every major city in Iran had a major uprising between the 28th, 7th of January, and then continuing on to today. Uh, and those posters and signs obviously are the same, so they were distributed all over the country with pictures of Madame Rajavi. Uh, you saw it on the, on, on the bridge but pictures of Madame Rajavi all over the country. And this is supposed to be a regime that is uh, able to, 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 to squelch these things. Well, obviously, it didn't. We know that during the course of this, probably in late December, Rouhani called the president of France and asked him to expel Madame Rajavi from near Paris, where we've all gone and met, met, met with her. And uh, President Macron, to his credit, basically told him to go where he belongs, which is hell, and uh, refused to do it. Uh, Madame Rajavi has played a significant role uh, from the very beginning in, in what is now going on in Iran. And this is the culmination of what she has been saying for many, many years, which is that the MEK is a significant movement in Iran and not just the MEK, but other uh, similar kinds of organizations opposed to the regime. Now, there is no organization as comprehensive as the MEK, or with the both internal and foreign, and where we would constitute the foreign support. Uh, but there are other organizations, and it, sh it should be clear at the outset that the MEK is not interested in dominating alone uh, politics in Iran. What it's interested in doing is having a democracy in Iran, which means that they may or may not be in power. But in any event, somebody will be in power, and let's go over a few of the 10 points of Madame Rajavi, because other groups can satisfy this as well, although this is the first one to do it. A, a de democratic Iran with free elections, with strong recognition of human rights, civil rights, and particularly the rights of women, because they're trampled on in Iran 
and other similar uh, extremist countries. Uh, you, can, you can see the rights of women are not only theoretically uh, embraced by uh, this organization, but they are practically embraced. Madame Rajavi is obviously a woman. And uh, many of the people at all of the demonstrations, in the audience, on the podium, are women. And the whole idea is to practice what we preach, which is human rights, equal rights, gender rights, and uh, the input of women. This has uh, not come at no cost. The cost is not just money, which you can replace, but the cost is human life, which you can't replace. And if you've seen the red books that the MEK keeps, PMOI on the cover, right? And, uh, you, 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 and you look through them. I had occasion to do it last night. You'll see that every single person who has been sacrificed, meaning killed by this regime, going back to the beginning, is in that book with their name. And here's the most striking thing. Just like these demonstrations, it's all over Iran. It's not just in Tehran, all over the country. So this is, this is a, major, a major uprising that is going on. I am very, very glad that at the very outset, back in December, when the president was in Florida, and this happened, he put out a very powerful tweet, which really basically changed American foreign policy. And what he said was that we support the protesters in Iran. That is exactly what Ronald Reagan did years ago when there was an uprising in Poland. And believe it or not, those words alone brought them to victory six, seven years later. Um, and uh, the solidarity movement, you might remember. But what can America do to further this? Well, Ameri this is not a military action. So America doesn't have to put troops in. And remember, we overcame, overwhelmed, beat communism without a single firing a shot. Although there were firings of shots and people who died in the 30, 40 year um, Cold War. First thing we should do is to make sure that there is open access to the internet without interference because there has been substantial interference. Up until December uh, 30th, and maybe at the core of how these things got organized originally was the use of uh, messaging telegram. And it was, um, it was encrypted, effective. And you'll know it's effective because they shut it down. And, um, and it has been replaced. And Iran claims they have internet, but it takes two or three hours to communicate. It is not particularly uh, safe. It's not at all private. And uh, it drives people onto the false apps where they can really be, uh, where they can really be uh, invaded and their identities taken. And therefore, the government can end up with foreknowledge of these protests. Now, having, having to deal with that barrier, it's amazing that they've been able to carry on these protests. The government knows about them. The government can spy on them. The government can interfere with the communications. Uh, that, that shows you that this is a, what I call a grassroots movement. To her credit, Ambassador of the UN Nikki Haley called for a, the emergency meeting of the Security Council on Iran, first one that's been held in quite some time. And uh, it did put some focus on what happened, and it did get some international support. But it's necessary to follow that up. So I would recommend to the administration that they let Nikki Haley free <laughs> and let her do what she wants because she is one tough lady. Uh, that would, uh, third, help us make these protests more visible so that they don't just happen below the radar. They get a chance to be seen. Because that, the minute you see these protests, you realize who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Uh, we also should uh, publicize more and support uh, relationships with the organized opposition. The most organized is the MEK, the Parliament in Exile, several other groups outside, because they all have tentacles inside Iran. And fifth, we should, um, we should make sure that particularly access to banking 
is cut off. Because if, in fact, a good deal of these protests come from economic hardship, this is a hardship that breaks your heart to see, because it, you can't say it doesn't affect the ordinary people, decent people of Iran, of which most people are. But these people have to be, um, these people have to be liberated. And if you look at what our people in, in Liberty and Ashraf and went, went through, and what they're going through now in, Iran, in Albania, although somewhat better conditions now, we lost a lot of people. And as, I, as all of us have said many, many times at our meetings here and in Europe, this cannot be done without a price. This revolution has its martyrs, many of them in the books already. And there are going to be other ones, unfortunately. But it's the only way you can liberate when you are controlled by a dictatorship of violence and terror. And finally, we should make it clear over and over again what the principles and the story of the MEK is. The story of the MEK is being assassinated in mass numbers at the beginning of the revolution, being the subject of vicious uh, fake news, which we now know exists, fake news uh, 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 programs, including the fact that they were a terrorist group, were listed as a terrorist group, had to work their way out of it, had to prove they were innocent, which is unusual in the US, but they did that. And now, uh, and now they're coming into the light of day and uh, getting the story of the MEK out from the very beginning to now. It's always been an organization seeking democracy, freedom, rights for women, rights for everyone, and a non-nuclear, peaceful Iran. Thank you.